Well, thank you and good morning, everybody. Prasada has just shown us the, uh, the scale up of funding over the last decade or so. Uh, this is uh, the resource estimates and uh, gaps projected by the investment framework a few years ago. And we've clearly seen that over the last 10 years uh, or so, there has been a substantial scale up of funding across the world. This is the first time in our history have we seen a systematic shift in funding from resource rich countries to low and middle income countries. And HIV has brought that about. Despite that fundamental shift, we, uh, we've known for quite some time that there is a large funding gap. But we have seen this large increase, and this large increase in funding has resulted in tremendous health and economic savings. There are many examples all around the world that have shown substantial impact of programs. One of the best examples is Avahan, uh, the program uh, implemented in India. Uh, in Avahan, we achieved very large scale and coverage, as you can see with these two graphs here. Uh, there was a large scale up to uh, uh, close to 100% uh, service inf infrastructure being used, uh, drop in centers, NGOs, and SDR clinics were largely scaled up. So, both scale and, uh, and coverage intensity were scaled up substantially. Uh, the proportion of sex workers and MSM reached uh, scaled up over time and reached towards saturation levels. And there was strong evidence that that scale up resulted in substantial declines in HIV prevalence. For example, among female sex workers, uh, prevalence reduced uh, by about 20%, and that's uh, statistically significant. There are many other examples around the world, and it's been shown that this is highly cost-effective. There are many other programs around the world that have been highly cost-effective with this large investment. However, clearly there has not been enough money. Uh, Prasada showed the estimates of uh, the, the funding gaps that, that, that still exist, and uh, the investment framework also uh, infers some, some uh, resource gaps. We clearly do not have enough to do everything that we need. We still have 2.3 million people that are newly infected uh, each year, and the number of people with HIV is continuing to grow. So we've got large amounts of money, but we do not have enough. And we know that over the next few years, we're unlikely to see subst uh, substantial increases in funding that, is, that are available. So we need, to look, we need to look at the money that we do have, and, uh, may, and I think we, it's essential that we use the money as wisely as possible. Unfortunately, we are all very well aware that much of the money that's been scaled up has been wasted. There are large administrative and, I put in quotes here, other management costs. We know that there's a lot of corruption, uh, and we know that there's a lot of, uh, lot of the funding that is not being used on, on direct programs. It's just, it is just being wasted. It's not being used most effectively. It is not a good use of global money uh, against this major public health threat. Programs have not been not operated most efficiently. Just the way in which they, they're conducted, the, uh, they're not reaching the scale, the intensity uh, that can mitigate the epidemic. But they're not reached the scale and coverage. The available money has not been allocated to programs which have the largest impact. And this is the lowest hanging fruit here. We know what, what works. Uh, Slim provided a, an excellent um, presentation this morning in the plenary, providing us with the, the evidence over time of the, the programs which are proven to be effective. We know what works. We know what is the most cost effective, but most programs that have been implemented have not been cost effective. A study led by Andrew Craig, published in the Journal of the International AIDS Society in 2014, earlier this year, uh, showed that uh, throughout all of Asia and Eastern Europe, it's a systematic review across all of the programs that have been implemented in those countries, the vast majority of those programs uh, that were funded were not cost effective, they were not allocated in the most effective way. We all know the slogan, know your, uh, know your epidemic, know your response. Your response should be tailored to your epidemic. So I'm going to provide an example of the Asia and Pacific region, given we're in this part of the world now. In Asia and the Pacific, 86% of all of the 5 million people living with HIV in this region are in just five countries. 97% of all people with HIV are in 10 countries in this region. Prasada gave an example of geographical targeting. It's highly important to target resources to the geographies uh, where the, of the people that are most affected. Uh, in this region, and in fact in every region, there are, there are countries that are most affected, and that's clearly where the most of the resources need to go. In this region, in the Asian Pacific, 70% of new infections are in the key affected populations of MSM, uh, people who inject drugs, uh, sex workers, and clients. There's only about only 30% in the general population. So that is the epidemic. That's the epidemiology here. 
So where would you think the resources ought to go? Clearly it ought to go to the, for prevention to the key affected populations. However, what do we see? This is uh, 16 countries with the data that are available uh, for this region. Uh, and the, the light uh, yellow bars there represent uh, funding for prevention that goes to the general population, the non-key affected populations. And the darker colour bars represent the proportion of funding going to the key affected groups. Across these 16 countries, there's a very clear trend. The money is not going to the key affected groups. This is very simple stuff. We know where the epidemic is. The funding is not, being, is not going there. The money is clearly being wasted. It's just inefficient allocations. I'll, uh, I want to provide just a very simple message uh, coming through by the end of my talk. And it's, the simple message is, know your epidemic and target it appropriately. The low-hanging fruit here is with the money available, we can allocate it better and we can do a lot more with the available money. There are two ways to do that. Firstly, to focus limited resources by geography and then by population group. The slide has also shown us uh, this slide, the figure here on the left where we know that uh, 27 out of the 77 provinces in Thailand account for 70% of the new HIV infections. Clearly, we had to, be, had the greatest impact by focusing on those areas. 73% of the epidemic in the Philippines is in just three cities. These are the areas, these are the hotspots that need to be targeted. So we need to focus resources by geography. Then we need, within those geographies, we need to invest for the biggest impact possible. I'd like you to think about how you, in, you invest your money, whether it be personally or otherwise, you think about what you might gain from it. How, when, you, when you're in, your, uh, in, in the countries looking at uh, investing in your HIV responses, whether you're providing assistance to countries or whether you're in the countries tr trying to figure out how you're going to spend money yourself or your colleagues or your, your superiors are trying to do that, how are they making those decisions? Are they thinking about what the impact is likely to be of the programs which they, they are implementing. When, I, when we look at the data, I doubt that that's the case. We see that the vast majority of the money is not going to where the epidemic lies. How are these decisions being made? Maybe it's historical precedent. There's other advocacy, other issues involved. But the money is not being allocated in ways that will have the largest impact. When governments make decisions about submission of the Global Fund concept sheets, when they come up with their operational plans, how should they be thinking of where they're going to allocate the money to have the largest impact? Surely with the limited resources available, we need to be thinking about what impact we're expecting to see and allocating the most efficient way possible. So before, clearly it's important to know your epidemic. UNAIDS has promoted that for a number of years now. But before you go from know your epidemic to know your response, I think there are a few steps in between. Firstly, know your program costs. How much does it cost to implement each different uh, program and different models of service delivery? Know your program impact. Is it working? Know your desired outcome. What are you trying to achieve? When you think about all these things together, you could look at the most cost-effective approaches to achieve your desired outcome. And when all of those things are considered together, then you can allocate money based on all of this knowledge to have the best possible, that is the optimal impact. The allocation should be based on objectives. What does one want to achieve? Is one trying to minimize incidents, minimize deaths, minimize dallies, as maybe a combination of the two? Well, I think most governments are trying to minimize the amount of money they have to spend, but they also want to achieve multiple targets in a national strategy. But once it's clearly identified what the objective is, the allocation of money and the program implementation needs to be aligned with that. So often we, or we all see that the different uh, targets in a national strategy might be epidemiological targets and not necessarily linked with the program targets. Why are certain program targets uh, listed? Is that directly going to achieve the epidemiological target? I think much more rigor needs to be applied to how we're setting our programmatic targets in order to reach our epidemiological targets. And then the allocation of resources need to be aligned with those uh, in order to achieve the, uh, the, the costs uh, the, the, well, the spending that's required in order to reach those objectives. Uh, my group at the University of New South Wales uh, has been developing a mathematical optimization tool. And we've been doing this uh, with the World Bank and we've been implementing it this, uh, throughout many countries around the world at the moment uh, to conduct formal, mathemat uh, formal uh, mathematical uh, optimization to find out what is the best, most optimal solution to meet the desired objective. 
to find out the right combination of coverage levels across different programs that's going to have the most cost-effective approach in reaching your desired outcome. For example, minimize the number of new infections over the next five to 10 years, or uh, with, the same, with the given amount of money available. I think this type, this type of approach is going to be necessary if we're going to use our resources most appropriately. I'm just showing you here one example from an African country. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, just uh, for, for sensitivity reasons. But it's just the last country in which uh, me and my team have, have worked, just, so I'm just providing that as an example. Uh, this country has been uh, spending $5.6 million per year on their HIV response over the last few years. Well, this is particularly in 2013. And the breakdown of that funding uh, is shown uh, there in the pie chart. What you'll see is that 50% of all funding was on uh, PLHIV involvement and support, management support, strategic information, all of these indirect costs. Uh, and uh, you see that 50% of that money is then spent on direct programs, ART and prevention. Using an epidemiological uh, mathematical model, we were able to project over the next, uh, over from the period from 2013 to 2020, we project that around about 48,000 new infections are likely to occur. Uh, so we looked at epidemic trajectories, and they occur in these subpopulation uh, groups uh, listed there. Uh, so the broad spread across different groups, mainly uh, by different age groups. Uh, of course, it's, uh, uh, well, this particular African epidemic is predominantly uh, driven uh, as a generalized setting. We then looked at every possible combination of how you could spend that money. We looked at the, the indirect costs in gray. We're not going to optimize those. Just look at the other program costs, so half of them. And if you, spent, uh, if you split it up in a different, uh, different proportion, cut up the pie a little bit differently, like, like so, we found that that would be the, the optimal, where you'd be a greater shift away from prevention in the general population, greater proportion of spending on ART, scaling, scaling up ART, and greater spending on female sex worker prevention, then what we could expect is a lower level of new infections. With exactly the same amount of money spent, you could avert 15% of the new infections over that period. This is easy stuff to do. You don't, you don't need extra resources. Using the same resources, but spending it smarter. Knowing your epidemic, knowing the costs of programs, knowing the impact of programs, and allocating money accordingly. Here's another example. This is uh, an example from uh, an Asian country just to our, just to our north. Uh, here, this is looking at different amounts of money available. And you can see that uh, in the middle there, we have the, the current uh, spending, where most of the spending is on, uh, well, about 50% is on ART. Uh, and then uh, quite a lot uh, is spent on needle and syringe programs uh, to address an injecting drug use uh, epidemic. But an optimal spend of that current uh, funding to minimize incidents uh, changes the allocation accordingly, actually more towards a sex worker driven programs because of an emerging epidemic there. And what this shows us, if we have a reduced budget or an increased budget, what are the priorities of programs? And doing such an analysis looks at what is the priority right now? You see that if you've got very little money, then what's the most important things to fund? And you keep on scaling them up until you reach them to scale, and then what's the next most important program, the next most cost-effective program to fund? Keep on scaling that up. And according to a most cost-effective analysis, shows that you actually need to have uh, further money if you're going to increase uh, ART, introduce ART, and then you scale that up to very large amounts of money. That's for prevention, for the prevention benefits. And accordingly, this is our, our estimate, estimated projections of the, the number of new infections expected. I think that's over a five-year period. And you see, with more money, you could get uh, lower infections, but you're starting to saturate out at these levels. One, one other thing that shows is that with reduced funding, then you could expect much larger increases uh, in the number of new infections. Defunding of programs can have a dramatic effect on uh, epidemics, and particularly those in middle-income countries. They face uh, a, large, a large battle at the moment as how they're going to, uh, to fund uh, these, uh, these, these programs. You can see the dramatic effect uh, through modeling studies and uh, through examples with that uh, have occurred in the past where the, the programs have been defunded. I'll go back to the first, uh, first country analysis, though, just to, to emphasize that of 100% that, of, of that funding, of the $5.6 million, about 50% of it was in indirect costs. None of the, that money is spent directly on prevention programs. None of it's spent on ART directly. Large amounts of money can be freed up by reducing uh, some of those inefficiencies. Freeing up a lot of that money can, can save people's lives, can save people from getting infected. 
and from dying. A study that uh, we did in conjunction with UNAIDS and the World Bank in Ukraine, uh, which was released uh, just last month, uh, looked at the program efficiency uh, of uh, programs for needle and syringe programs, uh, OST and ART for people who inject drugs. And a study showed that quite easily by, by using the existing models that exist in the country, reducing the, the, the variation between different service delivery models, that NSP, needle syringe program cost, can be reduced easily by almost 20%. OST costs could be reduced by at least half for the, for the settings that are standalone, and by 43% for, uh, for settings that are integrated with other sites. And ART costs can be reduced quite easily uh, by 28% for first line and about 40% for second line uh, therapies. By, changing, by looking at the uh, technical efficiency of programs, uh, we can easily reduce a lot of these costs, freeing up money to have greater impact in reducing new infections and reducing age-related deaths. So it's a simple message I'd like to put forward here. There's a great need to invest smarter. Yes, we've done an amazing job over the last, uh, last 10 years in scaling up funding uh, against HIV and AIDS in low and middle income countries. It's had a, an amazing impact, but a lot of that money has been wasted. We're not going to be able to reach the, all of the, the resource needs and meet all of the gap that's been identified to reach our overall targets. Uh, and therefore we must uh, invest our money much more smartly. The way to do that is to focus our investments. Focus it in the geography that where the people are most affected and doing it in a, in a very efficient way. Spending the money directly against the programs that will have the greatest impact. And there are, there are tools available uh, to assist in being able to do that. And uh, i just leave us with this quote here by one of, my, one of the heroes in my field, uh, Daniel Bernoulli. He, he uh, was promoting vaccination against smallpox in 1760 when it was endemic throughout Europe. And he, uh, he said just a little analysis using a very simple mathematical model. It's what he used uh, could show that you could save 25,000 uh, civil lives for France uh, in those days. Uh, and just very simple analysis could shift the way that the, pu the public health, uh, in fact, there was no public health before this, uh, how it was approached. And I think uh, it, the same thing could be done here. We've got vast amounts of money. It's a, very, it's a major threat against, uh, against our society uh, as HIV. Just a little analysis, focusing our resources, allocating it better, can have substantial impact. Thank you.